This is a project I've been excited to do for a long time. We are in the middle of allergy season in 2024, so I'm sorry if I sound sniffly, but I just couldn't wait any longer to do this. So let's get started. Um, we want a multi-purpose data structure for use in main memory that satisfies functional requirements with reasonable performance. We want quick, random insertions, deletions, and membership tests. We also want to be able to quickly retrieve the successor or predecessor to a particular entry within the data structure without having to enumerate the entire contents of the data structure. Essentially, we want a general purpose dictionary data structure for indexing keys, which is fast but isn't terribly difficult to implement or maintain. We want to build a useful tool for ourselves and learn something along the way. For that, I've chosen the AVL tree, named after its inventors, Adelson, Velsky, and Landis. The AVL tree data structure is a member of the class of so-called self-balancing binary search trees. Among the members of that class, this renowned tree is the original gangster. Hence, as you might assume, it is not terribly difficult to implement. There are surely faster trees and data structures out there. The time performance of this kind of tree is tied to the number of items stored in it, even if logarithmically. There are other types of data structures where this is not the case, and instead performance is tied to the length of the key, for example, radix trees, which would be exceedingly attractive for numerical keys. But to attain such performance, we may increase the complexity of our implementation. So such a tree may be considered in the future, but for now, this is kind of the perfect balance between being able to learn something, um, at least for me, it's the perfect balance of being able to learn something, build a useful tool, and not have the implementation be terribly, terribly difficult. So, these are the features that should be supported by our tree. We should be able to make a new tree, instantiate a new one, either empty or based on a provided sorted array of arbitrary size in linear time. Uh, we should be able to search the tree, a test of membership for a single key in logarithmic time we should be able to insert a single key in logarithmic time. We should be able to remove a single key in logarithmic time. Given a particular entry, we should be able to find the successor entry in order in logarithmic time. Same for finding the predecessor. Um, we should be able to retrieve the current size of the tree in constant time. We should get the contents of the tree and we should be able to get the contents of the tree in order visiting each entry by way of a callback function or retrieving multiple pages of entries one at a time. Um, we should be able to do these kinds of things in logarithmic time. We'll also implement um, the iterable or iterator protocol to, um, you know, that JavaScript offers just for the sake of it and because it makes testing convenient. Um, we should be able to do the set operations of union, intersection, and difference for two AVL trees in linear time. So I will elect to not store values in the same data structure since they can be keyed the same and handled in constant time in an ancillary hash map. You can feel free to change and benchmark this aspect yourself. I just felt it was not that important. But there will be three parallel implementations of the tree. All right, um, in doing so, we gain an opportunity to additionally profile the performance characteristics of the two different styles of approaches to data structure implementation, the JavaScript closure mechanism and JavaScript classes. We'll talk more about JavaScript, JavaScript closure mechanism later, but these are the three what we're going to do. So the first implementation, um, the tree is implemented with closures. The node type is also implemented with the JavaScript closure mechanism. The second type, the tree 
is implemented with JavaScript classes. The node is implemented as a class as well. The third one, now this is, a, this is like a cooking show. I already have it canned. I've already done this. So I'm not going to make you watch me type. I'm just going to, you know, um, do a code review and go over it. And then we'll do the experiment at the end. But so I already have the results as I'm t telling this to you, but I don't want to spoil it. So I'm going to tell you the third one, it's a mystery. Whichever of these first two is faster is what we'll end up doing for the tree. And the node will be just a simple JavaScript array. So we'll also be doing tests. Um, the tests will be, you know, I guess it's a relative thing. That I think they'll be kind of rudimentary, but um, they'll ensure that we're not going to violate the tree's ABL balance requirements in the course of mutating operations. And we'll discuss those requirements later. For both testing and benchmarking, we will use medium-sized arrays of unique integers shuffled a la Fisher Yates procedure. Medium size to me means sizes being four digit numbers. For benchmarking, we want to construct our own experiment, which allows us to profile the behavior of our AVL trees, including um, detection, consideration, and handling of outliers via two key fences. So we will run the experiment a number of times, and each will provide a variety of statistical figures. These figures will be written to a CSV file for viewing and comparison in a spreadsheet program. And that maybe seem boring to you, but the, the final part, the benchmarking and the analysis, that's the exciting part for me. So, all right. So let's talk about the balanced binary tree. So, a balanced binary tree. A tree, generally speaking, is a core type of data structure in computer science comprised of a hierarchy of nodes. So there's a single root node that you start at, and then that root node has zero or more child nodes. And each of those can have child nodes of its own, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, now, that's trees generally. Um, a binary tree is like a subtype of that kind of, uh, is a subtype of, of trees more generally. A binary tree is a tree where each node may have at most two children, the left and the right child. And importantly, the value of a node should always be greater than its left child and less than its right child. So here's an example of a binary tree. Okay, and don't <clears throat> read into the fact that the letters are out of are out of order left to right. It doesn't they don't represent numbers at this point. They're just arbitrary letters that I chose. So A is the root node. Its left child is B. Its right child is C. And um, B's left child is D. B's right child is E. C has no left child, and its right child is F. So if we were to assign numbers, like I said, um, the left child should always be less than the than um, a node, and a node's right child should always be more than itself. So if we were to just pick random numbers that are valid to assign to this, you could say like, this one could be one, this could be two, this could be three, this could be four, this could be five, this could be six. So, um, I'm gonna give you another example, just to the right here, of another, um, oops, 
of another binary tree. Okay, now like technically this is a binary tree. But, um, you know, this binary tree, it doesn't look much like a tree and it resembles more like a linked list. So even though this fits the technical requirements that we considered a binary tree, it is not suitable for use as a binary search tree. Because in this first example on the left, you'll need to traverse at most three nodes to find the one that you're looking for, right? If you're looking for D, you'll have to go at most one, two, three hops, right? But this one, you could have to go one, two, three, four, five, six, up to six hops. And, you know, for very, these are small trees, for very, very large trees, um, that discrepancy can be um, much, much more massive. So, um, you know, we want to have a balanced tree like on the left, where the left side of the tree has the same or approximately same height as the right side of the tree. It's better for searching. Pardon. Um, so, and, and that's for use cases involving frequent searches, inserts, and removals. So, as mentioned earlier, the first of these, um, you know, and so the trick of it, right, is like, I can just draw a tree out here uh, that's balanced, and you're like, okay, that's not that difficult. But the the, tr the trick is, you know, when you implement a data structure like this, is to keep the tree balanced as you continue to modify it, right? It's easy for me to conjure up a balanced tree on a canvas like this, but a live data structure where you're randomly inserting things and removing things, keeping it balanced as you continue to do those operations throughout the tree's lifespan, that's that's the challenge. That's the trick. And as mentioned earlier, the first of these self-balancing binary search trees was the AVL tree. There are other variants of self-balancing binary search tree, but they all share the goal of maintaining balance throughout the tree's lifespan and merely differ in how that goal is achieved. So, So now we're going to talk about that notion of balance more in imbalance and how we can correct it. So the AVL tree's concept of balance revolves around a figure. It's this notion of balance factor. That's what the AVL tree's concept of balance revolves around. So this figure, it's a number, an integer specifically. You calculate it for every <clears throat> node in a tree. will have its own balance factor. So for a tree to be considered balanced, that means every node, this balance factor number, has to be 0, 1, or negative 1. Any other number means that there's an unacceptable imbalance in the tree. And only one node has to have an imbalance for the tree to no longer be considered an AVL tree. And when that happens, balance must be restored quickly and correctly to maintain the performance guarantees for the various tree operations. <clears throat> so, the balance factor of a single node is a single number intended to give you an understanding of the height difference of its left and right subtrees. Okay? So, if you're calculating the balance factor for this node, it's intended to give you 
an understanding of the height difference of this subtree versus this subtree. Okay? So what's the height of this left subtree? The height is 1, 2. So the height is 2. The height of the right subtree is 1, 2, so it's 2. So what's the difference between these two? They're, it's 0. 2 is equal to 2. So 2 minus 2 equals 0. Now, figuring out how to produce this figure uh, is not difficult. It's just subtraction. The, the difficult aspect is remaining consistent after you decide how to produce it. There may be conventions that you should produce it one way or another. Left subtree height minus right subtree height or vice versa. But whichever way you choose, you must then commit to thoroughly understanding the implications of your choice. You should understand what a negative value for that figure means and what a positive value means regardless of how you choose to produce it. So <clears throat> if your equation is that balance factor equals left subtree height minus right subtree height, then that clearly means negative values indicate that the right is taller. Okay? And positive values clearly indicate that the left tree is taller. All right? So this is important to understand thoroughly so that later when you set out to remedy imbalances by way of what are called tree rotations discussed next, that's so that these operations can be implemented and utilized correctly. So this is my convention. The balance factor is left height minus right height. You can calculate differently if you want. Just stay consistent and understand how it impacts the things that you're doing. So, I'm going to talk about left rotations. And then we're going to talk about right rotations. These two things are just tools that you can use to restore balance in a tree. These themselves are just the two tools that you use. You will be composing them in different ways to attack four different situations of possible imbalances. Okay, There's four possible types of imbalances that you will encounter and each one has a different way that you compose left rotations and right rotations. So first I'm going to explain to you what a left rotation is and what a right rotation is and then we'll go through the four scenarios that you can use them on. So here's a tree. X N, Z, Y, N. Okay, so assume that this tree is either a subtree where X, element X is, uh, it has a parent which is an element in a bigger tree, or assume that element X is the root node of the tree. So X y and z are the significant nodes to this operation and the nodes labeled n are not required and they're only provided to help you imagine what this operation might look like in the context of a bigger tree and also technically what the y node is not strictly required for you to perform this operation either but when it is present it must be handled as i'm going to show you so after we perform the procedure left rotate with x as the argument, so I'm going to say, I'm going to put an arrow here and say, the name of the function, we'll call it L R O T L rot. Left rotate, where x, note x is the argument. After we perform that, we'll be given a tree that looks like this. Okay?
So, can I possibly zoom out on this? I don't think I can. Let me try and get, get them both back in the viewport here. There we go. So after we perform this procedure, we should re receive the, this tree as a response, where x went from being the parent of z, uh, where z is x's right child, to a different situation where x is the left child of z, and additionally z's original left child y is now the right child of x. And so let's assign some numbers that would be valid for these nodes to hold. And then we'll see where these numbers are on the right side, and you'll see that they're, the tree is still valid. Okay, 1, 2, uh, y is 3, z is 4, and n is 5. Oops. So you can see that really, this is still valid, right? I mean, we're still following the rule that a left child, the value of the left of the key stored in a left child is less than the node itself and the right child's value is greater than the node itself. This tree follows that rule. We just rearranged it. All right. And just for clarity, this function L, L L rotation, its return value is the node Z. Okay? So, um, right rotation is, it's just the inverse of the function that we just did. But I'll draw it out for you anyways. So right rotate the inverse will do basically the same tree, just kind of backwards. Okay, so we start there. Our rotation of x will give us a tree like this. So x goes from being the parent of z, with z being x's left child, to being the right child of z. Formerly y was the left child of x. That's not right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, formerly y was, my mistake, formerly y was the right child of z. And now it is the left child of x. So that backwards. And z is the node returned from this function. Okay? All right. And you can see why they call it a rotation, right? Because it's like if you just, like, actually, is there like a lasso select thing? Yeah, if you go like this, and then you were to, you know, kind of... <laughs> rotate it without rotating the actual letters inside of it and now this thing you know instead of being attached to the now it goes over to the other side you can see why it's called that right and the other pieces they kind of stay where they attach the things they were attached to okay so you see how we do that that's why it's called a rotation all right so these are the two tools, the left rotate and the right rotate. Now let's go over the four categories of imbalance which can be remedied by way of these tree rotations. So let me get my pen back. So the first category is where the left child is tall and the left child's 
left child is taller. All right. I tried to I tried to explain that as clearly as I can because sometimes people just say this is the left left case, right? Um, and sometimes you know that can confuse people like me. <laughs> All right. So the, I'm going to draw the tree first here. The root node is E. F is E's right child. C is E's left child. D is C's right child. B is C's left child. And A is B's left child. So when we say the left child is tall, uh, actually, you know what? Let's go through and annotate the heights and balance factors of this tree just um, to make it a little bit more clear even. So I'm going to put the heights in red on the left side of each node, okay? So the height of A is 1. The height of B is 2. The height of C is 3. The height of D is 1. The height of E is 4. And the height of F is 1. This gives us enough information to calculate balance factors. So let's do that and I'll go through and write the balance factors in this bright pink color. Actually, that's maybe not different enough. Let's do that one. Okay, so balance factor of A. A doesn't have a left child, A doesn't have a right child, so we're going to call its balance factor 0. B, well, its left child is 1, and its right child is null, or we'll say 0. So 1 minus 0 is 1. Okay, C. C's left child is, its height is 2. And its right child, it's, it's, sorry, its left child's height is 2. And its right child's height is 1. So 2 minus 1, get your calculator out, it's 1. Okay. And um, let's see, D. It's kind of the same case as A, right? It's been, it's just zero because it doesn't have any children. F also, it's a leaf node. It doesn't have any children, so it's zero. And finally, the balance factor of E. That's left child's height. That's C. That's three. It's right child's height is one. So three minus one, that's two. Okay, that's the offending balance factor. That's what tells us, because it's positive, and according to how we interpret the balance factor. That means that the left, the, the subtree rooted at E's left child, that's this one, is tall. That's what we mean by left child tall. Okay, two indicates that the tree rooted at C is tall. And since E's left child, I'm sorry, um, yeah, so, well, so, and, and then to figure out this part, how do we know that the left child's uh, left child is taller? Well, you know, it, it, it has a positive balance factor, right? It may not be an offensive one, but it's positive, so that means that its left child is taller. Okay? So, that's how we determine that we're left child tall, left child's left child is taller. Offending balance factor directs us to the left child. It has a positive balance factor. So here we are, in this left child tall, left child's left child taller. Okay, so we're gonna, how do we resolve this? There's only one step to resolving this. We do a, uh, actually, let's, let's undo that. Let me go back to my blue color if possible. So we're gonna do a right rotation of E. And that's going to give us this tree. Alright, so it's going to give us a tree where C is at the root, B is on the left, Uh, e is on the right, and 
we have A over here still. It didn't really do much. D went over here. And F is still attached right there. So that's much more balanced. Okay? C is now the root. E is its right child. D is now the left child of E. And how have the height and balance factors changed? Well, let's go through and calculate them and annotate them. So the heights are as follows. A is 1, D is 1, F is 1. We have 2, 2, and 3. These are the heights. Balance factors. Leaf nodes are always 0. Uh, B is equal to 1 minus 0, which is 1. Uh, e is 1 minus 1, which is 0. And C is 2 minus 2, which is also 0. So look how much more balance that is. All right. Um, and how have these actually changed? Right. If you're like, okay, so I, you know, it would be nice to know just well, like what were the changes? Well, um, the the balance factor of C was decremented by one. Right. Because um, it was one, now it's zero. So that was decremented by one. Uh, the balance factor of E, that was decremented by 2. And the height of E was decremented by 2. Those are the changes that I observe okay, to heights and balance factors in this tree. So that's the left-left case. Oh, I can just use my mouse. Great. All right, next one. This is the mirror version of the previous case. Right child tall. Right child's right child taller, all right? A, B, C, D, E and F, all right? Heights, one, 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 two, three, and four, all right? Balance factor, uh, 0, 0, 0, 0 minus 1 is negative 1, 1 minus 2 is negative 1, 1 minus 3 is negative 2. That's the offending balance factor that tells us the right child is tall. And if we look at D's balance factor, it's negative 1, which tells us that its right subtree is taller. So, the remedy for this situation is left rotation of B. Okay, and the tree that it yields is D, B, A, C, E, F. All right. So um, let's go through, and I'm just going to, yeah, we'll do the whole thing again. We'll annotate the heights first. One, 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 two, two, three, and zero, 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 negative one. Zero. All right. How have things changed? Um, the height of B has been decremented by two. 
the balance factor of B has been um, increased by 2 and the balance factor of D has been decrement, I'm sorry, increased actually by 1 plus equals 1. All right, so that is the right, right case. So, only two more cases to go. All right, I guess I... And this is where things get slightly tricky. Um, so, this is where the left child is tall and the left child's right child is taller. All right, in this situation, we require two rotations in a sequence to restore balance. So we have A, B, E, F, C and D. Height one, 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 two, three, four. Balance factors leaves are always zero. We have negative one, negative one, so one minus. 2 is negative 1, oh, and here is the offending balance factor, that's 2. 3 minus 1 is 2. So, first we need to do a left rotation of not the E node, but we need to do a left rotation, and you can pause the video if you want to try and figure it out yourself, but we need to do a left rotation of the B node. And that's going to give us the intermediary form of the tree. So that's going to give us A, B, C, E, F, and D. All right. So I'm not going to annotate the heights and balance factors. I think we did enough of that, but I'm just going to tell you how they changed at this point. So H, the height of B, and let's maybe, oopsies, I keep on clicking on that. I don't know what that is. So the height of B has been decremented by 1. The balance factor of B has been incremented by 2. The height of C has been incremented by 1. And the balance factor of C has been incremented by 2. Okay, now we're going to... Now we're ready to perform the next tree rotation. The next one is the right rotation of node E. And that's going to give us this tree. So we'll have C, B, E, A, and then D becomes attached to E over here, and F is still hanging over here. So, um, 
Let's let's annotate the final heights and balance factors on this. We'll do the heights first. One, 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 two, two, three. Balance factors are zero, zero. One minus zero is one. I think that's right. Yep. Um, one minus one, zero. Two minus two, zero. Okay. So that is the first of the two tricky cases. The next one is, let me use my mouse actually to drag us down here a little bit. So the next one is where the right child tall right child's left child is taller so we started with this tree a b oops i don't know what that is um where was i e d f and c i'm not going to annotate the heights and balance factors anymore you get that I'm just going to tell you the operations. We're going to do um, a right rotation of E. That gives us this tree. A, B, these have remained un unchanged. But now we have C and D up here. And E and F are down here. Okay. And then finally, We're ready to do the final operation, which is a left rotation of B, which will give us this nice balanced tree. We'll have A, B, D, C is down here. E and F. Okay. So those are how we can restore balance in the different situations of imbalance in AVL trees. I did not invent this, obviously, as I said. This was invented a long time ago. Um, but it's kind of a satisfying problem to solve in a weird way if you like things like crossword puzzles, etc. Okay, so the next thing is we're going to be talking about insertion workflow and removal workflow. So insertion and removal, they can be done iteratively, which means just like in a loop, or they can be done recursively. I personally, I'm not the first person to say this, but I personally find that sometimes recursive solutions can be easier to write, but harder for others to comprehend. So. I elected to use an iterative approach for both of these since so many other examples already use the recursive approach. It's only a matter of personal taste. So the insertion uh, follows this basic workflow. I'll annotate it on our final little tree down here and this I'll do in, I don't know, green. Okay, so um, you descend starting at the root of the tree until you find the place that the new key belongs. Let's say that the new key belongs like right here, all right, as the left child of E. So you'll start at D and you'll descend down until, well, that's a, maybe a bad example, but um, yeah, maybe we should pick a different example. Let's say that um, whatever, whatever this new element is that you're putting in here, let's say that it's greater than C and less than D, right? So you're going to hop down here until you find where it's going to go and then oh and then you insert the new note then what you're going to do is you're going to retrace your steps to the root of the tree so in the retracing i'm just going to do in this mustard brown color thing so you're going to go back to the tr root of the tree like this like this and then like this and 
each step along the way, you're going to check for AVL imbalances by inspecting balance factors. Whenever you find an imbalance, you're going to use the correct remedy from the four kinds that we just discussed, and then you'll quit the loop. So if you find an imbalance right here, you'll correct it, and then you're going to quit the loop. Okay, so that's the insertion workflow. Um, the removal workflow is a little bit more involved. So let me, it, it's just a little bit more work. So first you need to find the node that's going to be deleted. So um, if the node is a leaf, which means it has no children, that is the easiest case. Let's say you're getting rid of C, it has no children. So all you need to do is just kind of, you know, get rid of it. You know, you set that pointer, that le D's left child pointer to null, and there you have it. If the node has one child, so that would be like D, let's say D is the target of removal, then it's easy. What you need to do is you need to replace the node, which is being deleted, with its child. So you just get rid of D, and you reattach C as E's left child, okay? So that's also not too difficult to comprehend. Now, if a node has two children, this is a little bit more difficult to do. So first, you need to swap the node that's going to be deleted with its in-order successor. Let's say that um, node B here is the one that's going to be deleted. So first, you swap it with its in-order successor. So let me grab my mustard again. So its in-order successor is actually, no, that's also, yeah. Let's say, let's say D is the one that's going to be, oh, but that doesn't have two children. Well, anyways, we, we have, <laughs> I don't have a, a ready-made tree that has this example, but um, basically you swap it with its in-order successor, right? So let's, let's do the example of B anyways. Um, if it has two children, you swap it with its in-order successor. So you'll put C up here and B down here, and then you set the reference, uh, which used to be the successor, but is now the target to null and then retrace the steps to the root of the tree, correcting all imbalances found along the way. Okay. Um, so th it's a little bit more difficult to, to, um, to understand. I, I, I personally found when I was diagramming this out that it was difficult for me to diagram but easier to comprehend in code, which is weird because usually it's the opposite way, right? It's easier to understand in a diagram than with text, but You'll see um, once we get to the code. So now we're going to go over the implementation. It's enough of OneNote and these diagrams. So we're going to shift over to VS Code now. So here we are in VS Code. Um, so first, I'm going to give you some preliminary notes on. Um, function scope and closure mechanism. I'm doing that because I think most people are familiar with classes and inheritance, but I think few people, fewer people understand the, jo the JavaScript cl function closure mechanism and how it can be used to implement data structures, so I'm sharing a few notes on that. So JavaScript functions are so-called first-class types which can be passed into and returned from other functions. That means that they can be defined inside of one another so if we have a function abc and let's declare a variable in here called mystery and set it to a random number and now let's declare another um, function called xyz and this is going to return its argument n times the value of the mystery variable and that oops I don't know what, oh, there we go. Uh, and then we're going to return the XYZ function. So this function is what's returned here. This return statement belongs to the ABC function. So ABC is just generating a, is inside of it, it's execution scope. It's generating this mystery number. And then it's returning this function XYZ 
the function xyz has closure over this mystery variable and any other variables declared within its parent function scope. This means that xyz may access the value of the mystery variable even after the abc function has returned. That's after it has returned and it's no longer executing. So this affords the data structure the option of truly and completely private fields which didn't really exist with regular JavaScript classes until more recently. So if you wanted to test this out you could go like this and say console log abc xyz1 of 10. Okay now let's assume I'm not actually going to run this but let's assume mystery is equal to 0 0.12345678 all right then what is this going to print this is going to print 1.2345678 understand um, if we do console log abc xyz1 of a thousand this is going to print one one two three can i do math right yeah, dot four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. So that's so that's function closure. So with that in mind, let's go over the first version of this tree that I implemented, which is the function closure version. And that's where the node type is implemented with this closure mechanism. So this is the this is the type, the, the node type, okay? You can see that the default value of parent is null, that you can pass in a parent and it will save the parent. We are including a parent pointers in this node type so that we are not limited to traversing our tree in one direction without recursion. By default, we're going to set the height to 1. We're going to have the key that we store in here, left and right pointers. These functions can get and set these variables. And at the end of the execution scope of this node function, we're returning references to these functions. So this is our node data type. This is the AVL data type. Now let me just actually, um, if you're like, what does the class-based version look like? Um, you can check that out in the repository. Okay, uh, well, no, that's okay. I will go ahead and um, I'll, I'll, I'll show you what the class-based version looks like. I'm not going to go over every corner. Of, I'm just going to go through one implementation, but I'll show you this. So this is very similar. This is a class. This is functionally like equivalent, right? We have the class base node. These are the internal private fields. There's a constructor and then the getter and setter functions for which allow access to and manipulation of these variables. So that's the class based version. You can use your imagination to understand how the ABL tree implementation of a class is different, or you can just check it out in the repository. So, this is the ABL tree. Now, actually, before we go on, what's really the point of either of these implementations of the node type? You know, what's the point of having all these getter and setter functions? Wouldn't a simple object suffice? Now, that's true. Functionally, a simple object or array would be easier, but this gives us the future option of privately stuffing additional logic inside these getters and setters as needed without impacting any applications using this tree. Plus, it will be interesting to see if both of these functionally equivalent implementations perform the same. And finally, as I said, there is, an, there is a variant of this where we're just using an array instead of a class or function. So, so now we're going to talk about the tree. Now, I'm omitting the class version from this right up, from this um, sorry video, and you can just check it out in the repository. But I won't. Uh, we are going to be testing all versions of this tree. I'm just not going to walk you through the code because it's basically the same thing, you know, um, just in a different coding style. So,
Optionally, you can give it a sorted array. This is for bulk loading. If you don't, then it's going to give you a tree of size 0. If you do give it a sorted array, that's where the array's instance of array and the sorted array length is greater than 0. I'm not going to check if it's sorted. That's your responsibility. But if that happens, then we are going to um, create an AVL tree in linear time, linear in the length of the array. So we do this with this, where this is a recursive iffy, or a recursive immediately invoked function expression thing. It may seem to have an odd to have an iffy that has a name, but this needs to be <clears throat> use recursion, so the function needs a name. This is a critical feat. I mean, you can implement this a lot of different ways, but this this bulk loading feature, it's critical um, feature to have to be able to construct the tree in linear time if we want to efficiently do set operations like union, intersection, and difference, because the only alternative is for people to call the insert function over and over. So if I didn't have this feature, you might be like, okay, I have an, a list of a long list of numbers, a thousand numbers or ten thousand numbers or however many to insert into the tree. You're like, I'll just call the insert function like you know a thousand times, right? Once for each element in the array. That's not really linear time, is it? That's more like O of n log n or something even worse. Um, and it's it's clearly so much worse that I don't think we need to even really do the math. The writing is on the wall. We don't want to do that. So this approach allows us to construct the AVL tree. Um, by just, you know, <clears throat> it, it allows us to construct the ABL tree in linear time, right? Um, and so how does it really work? Um, it's actually not that difficult. So it's just, you calculate the, and I, when I say pre-order, that just means, you know, that we're doing the left child always, and then we're doing the, let's see, that pre-order is, you know, left child, then, or no, pre, pre-order, I'm sorry, that's parent, then left child, then right child, or something like that. Um, so actually, I found the easiest way to explain this is with an ASCII diagram, because you're probably sick to death of me drawing trees, pictures of trees. Um, so I'm not even gonna select a language, I'm just gonna copy and paste this, okay? So let's say we have, this is our sorted array, okay? So the first thing we do is we calculate in constant time, it takes us to calculate the midpoint of the array, which is like three, right? So that becomes the root of the tree. So here's a little ASCII diagram of the tree. So pre-order means we do the node itself first, and then we ask, what is the left child? So how do we figure out what the left child is? Well, we consider the remaining part of the array, which is here, and we basically say, what is the midpoint? Okay, and there's a formula for this. So I'm gonna give you the formula in like natural language, basically. So I'm just gonna put the formula up here so you can kind of um, see how we're doing this. So we're gonna calculate something called the lower bound inclusive, um, the, the midpoint equals you can see I was formatting stuff in Markdown. So midpoint equals lower bound inclusive. So for and plus the floor of the upper bound inclusive minus the lower bound inclusive over two. I didn't even find this online. I just worked it out myself. It's not that difficult um, if you consider how this would work. So let's just go through a couple examples. So what would the left child of the midpoint of the left part would be one, right? So that becomes one. Then we ask, what's the left child of one? Well, the left child of one is going to be zero. There's only one left. That's the case where the lower bound inclusive is equal to the upper bound inclusive. So the midpoint is the lower bound inclusive, which is zero. Now we are moving on to the what is the right child part of the you know pre-order traversal. So what is the right child? Well, that's going to be 2. Okay? So we figured out that it's there. Now we're moving on to asking what is the right... Now actually I should probably clean this up a little bit. 
He's already getting a little sloppy. There we go. Now we're asking what is the right child of this level of the tree. Um, you know, and this is going to be five, right? Because we're asking what's the midpoint of this, which is five. Okay. And then what's the left child of that? Four. Okay. And then what's the right child of that? Six. Okay. So um, I hope that makes sense. You can see we're just calculating in constant time what, what's the midpoint, what's the ideal left or right child in constructing this. So um, it's, it's kind of a fun little puzzle, actually, and I encourage you to work through like a similar problem on paper if this is confusing to you, because this is probably easier for you to work out than working it out just in code first, right? This code just reflects what we've done here, right? And it's a recursive solution, so. Okay, so that's the bulk loading algorithm. And let's see. What else? Reheight. This function is, it's a private function that we're not going to return. We're not going to export it. It's just for use internally. But it's, it's um, for, it's, it gives you a given, you take the node and then um, it sets that node's height to one more than um, the max height of its two children, accounting for cases where, you know, if one of the children is null, then it will use zero instead. So that's pretty easy. Here's the left rotation. You can see I was working through this. I did look through the Corman pseudocode and it ended up being similar. You don't have to look at the commented out stuff. These are prior experiments that did not work. This is what ended up working for me. All right. This is the right rotate function. It's the mirror image of left rotate. Balance factor. As I said, my convention is that it's the left height minus the right height. But this also accounts for cases where things are null. All right. Um, okay, searching. This is not, I didn't invent this either. Um, I didn't invent any of this, just the implementation. This is like, you know, the classic algorithm for searching for a key in a um, binary search tree, right? It's just um, while the node, the, the, this, well, this is this variable which starts out as the root node or one that you specify but as the root node by default while it's not null and its key is not equal to the key then you're going to check is the key left then the node's key then you're going to go to the you know and you just keep going down until you find what you're looking for or not so um, it will return null if it doesn't find something all right here's the insert you can see I have some console log statements here <laughs> This is the insertion algorithm. So this is just like a while loop, right? I said we're doing this iteratively. And we're descending down the tree. It's very similar to this. Until we find the place where we need to insert the new node. And then um, we're appropriately handling the parent pointers, attaching the new node. And then we start retracing our steps back to the root of the tree. This is node balance factor, left child's balance factor, right child's balance factor. And here we're figuring out what is the, what case are we? Are we in the left left case, the left right case, the right right case, or the right left case? And then we're composing those functionalities that we talked about earlier appropriately. So if you look back at the diagrams that we drew, you'll see this is this is what we're this is what we were talking about doing. This is just the code version of it. So then we have some functions for getting the minimum of a subtree or the maximum of a subtree. That's like the smallest value in a tree or the largest value in a tree. 
Um, and then successor and predecessor, these are slightly more complicated, but you know, these are going to tell you, um, they'll use these min and max of subtree functions. And because we have parent pointers, they're able to also consider what is the, we can, even if the, <clears throat> the successor is somewhere else in the tree that's not a descendant, um, we can traverse and get that, right? So this is for given a key. What is the next logical key in order, or the previous logical key in order? Here's the removal algorithm. As I said, this is a little bit more involved than insertion. The removal is you give it a key, it tries to find the key. If it doesn't, then we're done. If it finds it, then we're going to figure out which case are we in. If it's a leaf node, then it's easy, right? Because if it's a leaf node, then we just set its parent's reference to it to null, appropriately detecting if it's its parent's right child or its parent's left child. If it's um, one child, if, it, if, if the node to be deleted has one child, then we have to set its one child to its parent. Um, and then there's the two child deletion case, right? Where if the node you're deleting has two children, it's a little bit difficult, right? We have to swap some things around and um, to f find the successor, swap it, and then delete things, okay? Then we have the size, you know, variable. We have to decrement that because we are deleting things. We now traverse to the root of the tree, and we have to correct any balances that we find along the way. So we're doing the same thing as earlier, basically, right? Where we detect that we're in the left-right case, we do the left-right case remedy, okay, and so on and so forth. And that's it. That's, that's insert and removal in successor and predecessor. This function is for in-order traversal of the tree. This means if you have the numbers 1 through 10 in your tree, what it will do is it will, you know, yield. This is a generator function, which in JavaScript, oh, Cliff's notes of that, if you don't know what a generator function is. A normal function is also known as a subroutine. A normal function or subroutine means, like, you know, you give it so you give it an argument. You give it uh, arguments that you pass into the function, which is like a machine, which runs, and then it gives you a return value at the other end, and that's it. Okay. Um, a generator function, also known as like a coroutine. It's like you can give it some arguments, but basically, um, you know, the machine, it, it will continue to yield um, values. Yields value A. Oops. And then it can yield another value again, value B. And then it can yield. So instead of just returning once, it just keeps yielding values until it's exhausted. Okay, that's that's what this asterisk means. It's a generator function, so we use yield instead of return. And here we're using yield star, which means that this is a recursive generator function. So it's recursively invoking itself. So yield star delegates to another generator function so it's doing it recursively right so this is not actually going to be linear time is it i think this is going to be more like o of oops um you know in the big o notation i would say this is probably more like o of n log n unless there's some kind of like hidden optimizations in the javascript engine because think about it every time you want to get a node you have to go traverse you know you have to yield up the delegated yield tree all the way to the root in order to get the value back. So I think this is not actually truly linear, linear time, but this is a convenient little thing for us to have because way later on, we, we then we just basically wrap it in symbol that iterator, and this makes the whole thing uh, an iterator that we can use the spread operator and stuff like that. So that's why we did that. 
This is actually probably closer to linear time because we just take a callback and then we do the classic algorithm for, you know, doing the in-order traversal. Um, and at each one, we, you know, at each node, we just call the callback. So this is probably closer to linear time. And then there's a paging interface. The paging interface, I'm proud of that. This is, I was like, why not? Why stop here? And it, this is kind of like somewhere in between these two. It's like, um, it's a generator function again. And every time it yields, it doesn't yield, it, it'll, it'll just yield like a, um, a list of keys, right? So how does page in order work? It's like um, page in order, let's say you have um, like, you know, 0, 1, 2, all the way through 10. Um, and you're like, page in order, give me like, you know, at most like three keys at a time. So the first time it yields, it'll yield like one, uh, an array, which has like 0, 1, and 2. The next time it'll give you like three, four, and five. This one will give you six, seven, eight. And then the last time it's going to be like, here's nine and ten, I'm done. Right? That's what page in order does. This is so that you can, you know, if you have like a really massive number or however many you have in the tree and you're like, I can handle doing a fixed number of these things at a time, that's what it's for. Right? And it does yield just no normal yield, not yield star delegation. It just yields the results array every time. And it also has this thing, research max, which means if you want to research, want it to do another search um, in between every yield to make sure that the max of the tree hasn't changed in case you're like manipulating things. But anyways, and then finally, if you want to get a reference to the root of the tree or the length, current size, that's it. Okay, now um, that's all of these functions. Now we're going to talk about the, I, I gave them some goofy names, but these are the set operations. So union, that's, that returns a set of all elements from either of two sets. So we want a function that accepts two AVL trees as arguments, then produces a new AVL tree with the contents of the two trees it was given. I did not invent this approach. This is a well-known approach for accomplishing this task in time, which is linear in the number of items in the two input trees. Okay, so just real quick, right? If if one set has the elements 1, 2, 0, 1, and 2, and the other one has elements 1, 2, and 3, then the union of these two is going to be 0, 1, 2, 3. Okay, no duplicates. So, We're going to use the visitation callback system to extract a list of all the members of the A set, then the B set, and then we're going to iterate. Excuse me. I'm going to iterate through these and follow this logic to basically create a single array, which is all of the elements of these, just you know, in order, right? And then we're going to use put that into the AVL tree um, bulk loading constructor. Okay, intersection very similar, except it's only those. It's only going to take the, the iteration logic is just going to be different. It's going to take only the elements that are in both. Okay, if if any elements that are only in one of the two sets, those will not be included. And then the difference. This is the order of these arguments matters because difference means elements which are in the first set and not in the second one. So if you put the two things in here backwards, you could get a different result. And I'm cheating a little bit. I'm using JavaScript set, which if it is, if this data structure set if its performance for insertion and search is logarithmic, then this is not going to be efficient. Ideally, this sh should be implemented using a hash set where this is constant or amortized constant time, but I'm cheating a little bit, okay? 
So we're just going to cross our fingers and hope that works okay. All right. So that's it for these. Now let's talk. We're going to go through some uh, utility functions that we're going to build for ourselves. Let's see here. I have them over here on my other screen. I'm going to get, the, get that for you. Okay, so actually I don't have them in this. I'm just going to, oops, not there. Let's, I'm sorry, I named things cheesy by the way in case you haven't figured that out by now. But that's okay. J, utils.js, I'm going to call this this. Okay, so these are, the, we're going to go through these functions. These are utility functions that we need for doing things. So let's start with shuffle arrays. So this is known as the Fisher Yates shuffle. It's a venerable method for thoroughly shuffling, shuffling an array in linear time. Conceptually, it's like drawing a truly random card from a pile of cards. So think like a messy pile of cards like in the game Go Fish. Imagine that you have a, a way of drawing a truly random card from that pile every time. And every time you draw, draw one, you place it aside on top of a neat stack. And you repeat that process until there are no more cards in the messy Go Fish pile. That's basically the Fisher Yates Shuffle. Except for the Fisher Yates Shuffle does it in place in an array without any auxiliary um, space used. It's the, it iterates backwards. You can see it's actually iterating backwards from the end of the array. Technically, that is only a convention. It's not required in order to do this correctly. It's just it's a convention for a reason, and that reason is that it makes it mechanically easier to select a random entry from the remainder of the array than if you were to iterate in the forward direction. Okay, so your 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 proverbial stack that you're setting your random cards on top of, that's built at the end of the array, right? And it's always growing in the downward direction. And you're randomly selecting from the remainder of the array items to put there. So if that, I hope that makes sense. We're going to need this for both testing and benchmarking. It's very useful to be able to shuffle an array in linear time. Um, the next thing, let's see, expectations. <laughs> this one, you're, you, some people might laugh at this, but and they're like, why not just use a library, dude? But we're already doing everything ourselves, so why stop now? You can't stop me. So this is um, this gives us an ability to configure how we want to expect test results, right? So the results are, so this is an iffy, right, that starts here an immediately invoked function expression and it returns to us this function so ex the value of expectation becomes a function that takes one argument called debug one parameter and it has closure over the results array so multiple invocations of the expectation function will each have their own results array or results map and what does this inner debug or this inner function that it returns do well, you can give it debug as false or true, <clears throat> okay, and that configures um, how these two things are going to work. And this array that's returned from that is two functions. So the first one is how we actually insert values into the results, okay? These are, you put a actual value, the expected value, and then the label, which is by default a UUID, and then we have you know, basically, and it has a counters, right, for that, they're associated with that label. This is, this function will dump the contents of this to the console for you. Okay, and then these are two math functions that for some reason are not in the math, standard math, um, you know, library or whatever for JavaScript, but we need to calculate a percentile Percentile is like, you know, if you want the 75th percentile, that's like of a set of numbers, that's like, um, you know, what number from that set of numbers is like, you know, 75% of the other numbers less than it, you know, that kind of thing. Um, this is just based on an algorithm that someone was explaining in natural language that I found online, and it seems to work okay for me. 
Um, standard deviation, I don't know, for some reason this is also not um, a standard function, so we just implement it ourselves. It tells you um, how much variation or dispersal there is in a set of numbers. So if a set of numbers is more spread out, this number will be bigger. If they are less spread out, it will be smaller. Okay, so testing. I'm going to take you through the test. All right, um, now let's see. This is actually the utils is going to be in the parent, so I do have to change this. So this uh, test that we're doing, what does the test do? So first we get our expect and dump functions from the expectation. This is a canary failure, right? True is always equal to false, so we should always see the canary failure from our in our uh, terminal. This is to make sure that our test is running. You can um, forget about that. This is my original, some of my original testing that I did. And <laughs> I told you I named things cheesy. This is our testing routine, okay? Um, so we're gonna get an array of 5,000 unique integers. And each integer, each value in the array is going to be set to the value of its index. So we're going to have the numbers 0 through 4,999 in an order. And then we're going to shuffle it so those numbers are all in a different order. Then we're going to create a tree, an empty AVL tree. And we're going to go through all of the odd indexes in this array that we generated. We're going to verify that the key at each odd index is not in there. Then we're going to insert it and then we're going to verify that it is in there. And then we're going to check the balance factor of the node that it's, that it's valid. Once in a while we're going to um, Every, you know, like 500 um, indexes or so, we're going to perform an additional test routine where we enumerate all of the contents of the entire tree and we verify that the node of each is acceptably balanced. Okay. Um, let's see, in the next part... Yeah, and then we're testing the removal, that it remains balanced, right? And that um, it's remaining balanced throughout all of our removals. Um, and then this is just going to be testing the bulk insertion feature to ensure that the tree is well balanced at every node after we use the bulk insertion. And these are just some rudimentary tests to ensure that we can do union intersection and difference correctly. All right. So that's the test. And the test is, is going to be essentially the same for all three of them, right? Version one, two, and three of the tree. This is the fun part. So, yeah. Sneak peek. Okay. So this is the um, bench. This is the this is the really exciting part. Aside from tree rotations, we get to design our own experiment. And I'm not against using benchmark libraries. I just really wanted to design my own experiment. So I make one benchmark file for each of the three AVL tree implementations, and the layout of each file looks like this because I wanted to create corny names for functions, <laughs> but let's go through it. So we're using the, the we're creating a, an array of shuffled unique integers again. We're going to insert um, the odd indices of the array. Um, and we're going to do, you know, like a thousand of them and then 2,500 in another tree. And you can tell how they're named. And 
so basically we go through and use performance mark to once we have loaded them with the odd indices then we go through all of the even indices of our shuffled array and we test because now the tree has a particular depth right I mean we have a thousand entries in it or 2500 in it so now we go through the, the even indices which all are not in the tree right because we only inserted the odd ones so now we're going through the even indices and we're timing how long it takes to insert it and then we time how long it takes to remove that same one and we're collecting these um, we're measure then we're measuring it and we're collecting them the durations that we measure okay for insertion and deletion and we do this for the one the tree that has 1,000 keys in it already and then for the one that has two and a half thousand and then don't know what that is um, and then we go through and this is returning a table of statistics based on the run that we just did okay so this is the fun part for me I really enjoy playing around with statistics we have the we're going to sort all of the insertions and removal durations and give them a label and then we're going to map them into these tables of statistics so how do these um how does this process work so there's there's four lists of durations that we've collected right there's um the short avl insert durations the the, the short avl removals the long AVL trees insertions and the long AVL trees removals. And for each of those lists, so for this list and for this list, for each of these lists, we're going to produce three tables of statistics. So the first table is raw. So the raw statistics, these are calculated without any awareness of outlying values, if any. Next, we're going to calculate upper and lower Tukey fence values. So these are like dynamic thresholds we can calculate from percentiles to detect outliers. So we're calculating a lower and upper outlier fence, uh, far lower and upper far out fences, okay? And after calculating these fences, we can do two things, or we do two things, right? So the first strategy is we calculate basically the same statistics table that we did before, but for only those durations which are not outlier values. So this is a strategy where you just delete all the outliers and calculate your aggregation functions like average, etc. We also follow a, we also produce yet another one called all outliers recoded. So in this strategy instead of deleting the outliers, you recode them. This means you replace the value of each outlying duration with the value of its closest fence before calculating the statistical summary. So this is more than just a few averages right it's but it's still a manageable amount of numbers as you'll see it's it's not a small amount of numbers but it's not a massive one either it's it's a reasonable amount of numbers for us to consider as humans compared to our duration arrays you can think of it like the mathematical equivalent of a pointillist impression of a beautiful landscape and finally this is mostly opinion but this is my approach um, to rendering out the stat statistics to a csv file because i'm not going to look at them in a JSON file. I'm realistically only going to, you know, um, I, I'm only going to be doing this. And um, I, I re I'm just saying, realistically, I'm only going to be doing this in Excel. So let's go ahead and edit the test and bench files to have the appropriate path since I downloaded this. I will show you the stats tables that I did because originally when I ran this, I ran it on Replit and I have stats from doing that experiment there. And we'll also calculate stats running on my loud and noisy gaming laptop. So let's go ahead and edit these and then we'll run the experiment. So let's see here. We have gotta edit these two and then these two. Okay, so these I think we need to not relevant. That's a future experiment. Um, this is a bench file, so we have to correct the path.
Okay. I think that's good. Okay, deleting this. Great. Now, hopefully the camera will not have to cut away and this will just work the way that we're expecting. So I'm actually gonna, I already have these um, files aggregated. So I'm gonna actually um, remove these. I'm going to delete that. I'm going to delete that. And I'm going to delete that. Okay. So first, let's run the tests. So um, let's do node one avl.js. Ooh, export. Um, let's see. What am I doing? To load an ES module, type module and or use the MJS extension. <laughs> right. That's true. Um, I was doing this on Replit where it doesn't really matter. So um, let's do. Yeah, we can do um, type equals module. Yeah, let's do that. So let's do npm init dash y. And see if that fixes our error. If not, I will just take this back to Replit and we'll do it there. Oh, my bad. We don't want to run the AVL file. We want to run the test file. All right, there we go. So you can see all of our expectations are successful. We have our canary failure, and that's it. Let's try the two. The second version is also successful. And three, the third version is successful. So let's run our benchmarks. I haven't even told you what the third implementation is. I guess I will just tell you now. No, I will tell you when we look at the stats. I don't want to spoil the surprise. Okay, so let's bench this. Yeah, it gives you this warning. I don't care. <laughs> All right. Um, two. All right, and three. Okay. So we have our statistics. Now, I'm going to open the file explorer um, on my other monitor here and open up these. So let's open with LibreOffice. Here's one. Okay, I'm going to go to open two. Here's LibreOffice. And oops, let's open three. All right, and open with LibreOffice. Okay. And then we're going to open up the prior run from Replit. Okay, so I'm going to open up the, the prior results, which is the same code, just I ran it on Replit. Okay. So, you can see that I've annotated these. These are what they look like, right? Um, the CSV files, essentially. So I put them into an, um, an ODS workbook, and each tab is one of the trees. So number one is the type where it's function closures. Number two is the type where it is um, classes. And what is number three? Well, let's look at one and two first. So let's see here. Uh, we have... Let's sort by the max values in descending for one and two. All right, so it looks like our max values 
it's looking it's it's number two is looking better right number two has uh is doing better in terms of the max values they're smaller uh, and you can tell the max values vastly vastly exceed the typical other cases the averages and the various percentiles okay even the 99th percentile the max values are quite exceptionally large so what does this mean that the maximum values so are so vastly larger than the other typical use cases my theory is that it's garbage collection um i just you know that the in fact the sum <laughs> look at the sum the sum is just barely under the max value so i think that that means geez most of it was garbage collection right um so it, it, or whatever is taking up that amount of time i guess it could be a bug or some pathological case but if we're comparing these, so clearly we have some outlying durations, you know, that are blowing everything else out of the water. And in that way, two is doing better than one. Look at the difference between, uh, with number two, look at the difference between the highest max and the sum versus the highest max. Let's make sure we have this sorted descending. The highest max versus the sum that's worse, you know, the closure one. So I think what closure, even though I prefer it in the sense of I like some functional programming principles and uh, it makes a lot of sense to me and it's kind of a cool thing that you can do even in older JavaScript engines, the performance just doesn't look as good. Okay. Um, and so based on that, and there's other ways that we can look at this too, right? I mean, we can look at averages. Let's look at averages, right? Um, averages descending, okay. Um, 0, 0, 8 versus 0, 1, 4, okay. Um, you know, so I'm just in what's like the best average if we go way down to the other end. Uh, you know, the best average is uh, number one is 0, 0, 1, 4. What's the best average in column P of this one? Zero, 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 0004, okay. Um, so this was my run on Replit. So just based on this, that no matter how you crack it, there is, um, there's just, it's, the performance of the class is better. We can look at the variance too, okay. The variance, um, we can do standard deviation. Now, there's a thing, right? Standard deviation, as I said, it's a measure of the dispersal of a set of numbers. There's one weakness. Um, it can give you kind of a weird impression because sometimes if the average increases like a lot, then the standard deviation can increase. So um, even if the, the standard deviation relative to the average remains the same. So that's how we produce the coefficient of variation. We take the standard deviation divided by the average. Um, and the CV in cases where, let's see, let's sort by the CV once. In my experience, in cases where the CV is greater than one, that can indicate significant variation in the data set. That's cases where the average, where you could say it's almost like the average distance from the mean is greater than the mean itself. And if I'm looking at this, the CV, oh, it looks like the CV is worse. There's more variation with this one, maybe. You know, the, the worst values of CV are worse on number two. So maybe, you know, maybe um, in that respect, the, the closure one is better. Uh, what about standard deviation? Let's sort descending there and see what happens. Okay. And this isn't even filtering by the types, right? <laughs> uh, you know, this is, and you can see when we sort by descending, always the raw ones are at top. But what if we filter out the raw? Let's consider these two without any raw, all right? Um, no raw. So if we do no raw, and then we do, um, let's do, let's do average descending. For each of these, which one has better averages? Zero zero one eight 
zero zero seven seven. Uh, recoded makes it to the top. Recoded, yeah, I'm gonna say I got to hand it to version two. The average seems better. Okay, when we're doing something, either approach, right, of recoding or removing. I guess we could consider the removal and what separately, but I think the writing is on the wall. Just the version two of this tree, it's just preferable, right? That's the class-based version. And some of the functional programmers, they kind of are shedding some tears right now. But, you know, in, in extreme cases, I mean, you, you see what the max values are like in the raw, right? Like, we're just recoding these for the sake of comparison, but the typical cases, but in reality, these raw cases, which I, where these max values, these are gonna bust your, your budget. Eventually, you're gonna, if you're using these data structures in a game or something like that, eventually, these are gonna, these are gonna kinda screw you over, right? In either case. So you wanna try and reduce these outlying values. And in that way, I decided that the class-based version was better. So for the third version, where we decided the node type would be an array, and I had to decide on an approach for the tree type, I decided on classes, all right? So mystery revealed. And let's take a look here. Um, let's see, the max value, is this descending? I think this is descending. You can see, can I remove the filter? Okay, the filters are removed. This is also descending. Um, 19, 3, 1, 18. So this is even better performance than number two, it seems like. What about the averages? Um, average descending 0, 0, 8, 8, 6, 0, 0, 8, 2, 6. Let's do on the other end ascending. Zero 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 five seven nine zero 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 five one five. So this version seems faster in a lot of respects, and you could really dig into this even further uh, and compare inserts versus removal across the two trees. But I think we didn't even need all these numbers to decide that the class version is just faster. This is the the experiment, the same one that I just showed you that I ran on Replit. Let's look at the same. Um, the same numbers, but the one that we just just did on my gaming laptop here. All right, so so I guess I need to know the names. What was the name of the one? That would be the one that ends in 527. So I'm going to rename this sheet. I'm going to call this one. And that is spreadsheet 527. I have quite kind of a lot of them open here. 572. Five, is that what I said? 572 five, or 527? 572. 572. Okay. So I got the right one here. Let me copy all of the values. Actually, you know, I think I can just control A. Yeah, there we go. Okay. And then um, let's go ahead and filter these columns. So we can go to data auto filter. And this is number one. Looks like my gaming laptop is a lot faster than Replit. Wow, who would have thought that? <laughs> okay, so that's from tree number one on my laptop. Let's go to number two. Number two is the spreadsheet that ends in one, one, three. Okay, and then we're going to grab the number, the tree number three. So yeah, number two. And number three is going to be six, two, eight. Here we go. Okay, let's filter these columns to data auto filter. 
data auto filter okay so let's sort let's check the let's check do our cheesy thing and sort by the max values you're like Dave you didn't need all these statistics if you're just gonna do a descending sort of max values but that's okay um, I don't mind we had fun along the way and learned how to do some stuff ourselves ourselves so let's look at the descending maximums um, wow this is really really great on my gaming laptop I mean four nine six nine seven for tree number one three nine two nine six so even on my gaming laptop initial impression is that the class based AVL tree is faster and the one where the nodes are arrays is like way faster even so this really blows away the performance compared to the gaming laptop um, look at the sums even right I mean geez the sums were in like 40 whatever um, 30 40s so let's get rid of the raw okay and see how the cases where we're coping with the outliers by recoding or something else how those look so the max under the raw wow I mean geez you know let's do a uh, descending sort on the average Wait, look at that you know I mean this is really really good performance of course we only have a few thousand elements in these trees. If we had hundreds of thousands, you know, or millions, it could be worse. But boy, look at that! This is just this is really crazy fast. It's and this is where this is in milliseconds too, right? So this is really really hard to you know hard to beat. Okay. So that's our performance. What's the conclusion that I draw from this? Well, the conclusion that I draw is that I'm going to use the class-based AVL tree that I made, and, uh, probably, and I'm going to use the class-based AVL tree where the nodes are just arrays, and I think that performance is going to be great. So that's my conclusion. I'm going to open source this on GitHub. I'll put the link to that in the comments and also the written version of this, uh, also the link to that. Thank you so much for watching. This has been really fun. Uh, feel free to use this. Um, it's a really fun little tool that we built for ourselves. Have a good one. Bye.